This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 6, The Habsburg Castilian Empire. What primarily shaped the immediate new post-1500 global system was not Oceanic Europe's entry into the old world of the southern and eastern Eurasian maritime realm, the Indian Ocean and China Seas, but Oceanic Europe's embrace of the new world, the Americas, immense, underdeveloped, military vulnerable, and with a richly exotic resource base. Europe in the New World was primarily a Spanish enterprise. The Portuguese landed in Brazil. Spain was the pioneer European colonial power, the pioneer European bureaucratic state. Spanish administrative success was striking, despite the corruption and slowness of the bureaucracy, it did function and did so globally. This was without precedent, and it lasted for 300 years. The commercial center was Seville, a riverine port, but core of the Spanish commercial system. The political center was Madrid in the arid pastoral Castilian interior, where much of the surrounding area was unsuitable for agriculture. Spain exported wool and other raw materials. It remained undeveloped even after the bonanza of empire. Madrid was the seat of the court after 1561, an artificial city, a political force, an economic dependency due in part to the viscosity of land transport. The city had to be supplied by pack horse and mule. Perhaps Madrid serves as a metaphor for the Spanish Empire. What made Spain become an empire? It was unique in Oceanic Europe because it was a continental empire, both in Europe and beyond. Two events initially consolidated Spain's position in the European world. First came a cultural consolidation, the expulsion of the Moors, Arabic speakers. Second was political, a royal marriage. Ferdinand of Aragon, aggressive, wily, and shrewd, the supposed model of Machiavelli's prince, was both lion and fox, he married Isabella of Castile. But this was an imperfect union. Spain is an invertebrate, Ortega laments. Castile was dominant, others resentful. The reality was an uneasy alliance among peoples with their own historical traditions, customs, even languages. Maritime Catalonia versus continental Castile epitomizes the differences. Today, Spain is still sorting this out. Through subsequent strategic marriages, Spain became virtual hegemon of Europe, but it was simply a dynastic state, not a nation state, ruled by a multinational German family, the Habsburgs, in a tenuous, blood-based, fragile monarchy. The vitality of the state inevitably reflected the character and personality of the sovereign who held absolute powers. Monarchy and church offered the only means of holding together a supranational, plural coalition. Other countries would follow later, but Castile became the first early modern European state to succeed in creating an extensive land empire far from home based on projection of power across the ocean. This 
was the world's largest pre-industrial empire, seizing a vast resource without the later advantages of quinine, the Gatling gun, or the electric telegraph. For the Spaniards, steel weapons and horses were the key weapons, not guns. The pastoral Castilians saw themselves as a chosen people, buoyed by a sense of mission, a mission to nourish the faith. Monarchical Spain opened the possibility of one universal empire, one flock with one shepherd, superior to the Roman Empire in size and superior in character because it was Christian. Spanish exploration and conquest represent a stunning achievement carried out under royal license but not royal direction by small groups of adventurers aided by local allies. It was essentially limited to one continent, an exception being the Philippines off the coast of Asia. It was based initially on the violent subjugation and Christianization of established states and the exploitation of existing resources. Spain became the destroyer of Mesoamerican civilization. Spaniards were not only the bearers of biological catastrophe, but also agents for environmental destruction. Spanish America, Peru, and Mexico was then the world's largest producer of silver. Japan, surprisingly, was the second. Silver, durable, with high value to weight, becomes the first product in history traded across all oceans. China was the largest consumer, followed by India. Europeans acted as intermediaries. For this, the Philippines provided a major conduit. Treasure ships pursued a solitary route from Manila to Acapulco, but silver moved over both oceans, Atlantic and Pacific. In Europe, an increasing amount led to a fall in the value of silver. Prices rose, and it took more and more silver to buy a basket of other goods. But more important in the long run than any quantity of silver would be food crops. These were the real treasure of the New World. For Africa, this meant manioc, maize, and the sweet potato, providing new staples to revolutionize the diet. Also from America, introduced to Eurasia, were potatoes, the chili pepper, the peanut, tobacco, tomatoes, pineapples, These brought huge demographic and dietary impacts, leading to a population explosion in China. New crops could be grown on hitherto marginal lands. They also made new dishes possible, the chili pepper, for example. What would Korean cuisine be without kimchi? Insipid. Or imagine spaghetti without tomato sauce, pallid, tasteless. Via the ocean, embracing a new and wide range of climates, Europeans were able to tap an unparalleled share of planetary biological resources. This was a huge windfall. In the late 1500s, King Philip II carried Spain to its heights of wealth and power. Philip ensconced himself in the grim and bleak, harshly beautiful Escorial, a majestic royal residence, art gallery, library, as well as tomb, containing thousands of body parts, religious relics. It sits on a stark plain outside Madrid, shaped like a grid to commemorate St. Lawrence who was martyred in death by being burned alive. Three churches in Rome boast that they have drops of fat from the saint's corpse. Philip was a complex personality, 
He loved dancing and playing the guitar. He had a keen eye for the ladies, and yet he was harsh and unforgiving. Protestant historians give him a satanic image. But clearly, he was serious and allowed himself little time for diversion. Picture the monarch at his desk, cramped arthritic fingers, pushing his pen wearily over piles of documents deep into the night. He preferred solitude. He thought meetings largely a waste of time. He chose dealing with paper, reading and writing a prodigious amount. He might sign hundreds of letters in a day. A micromanager fussing over the location of toilets in the Escorial and yet complaining bitterly of being exhausted and overworked. Psychologists would define his as an obsessive-compulsive personality. Ships traveling slowly worldwide carried the royal commands. One voice, Arroy, awaiting his instructions, commented, If death came from Madrid, we would all live to a very old age. The empire was so immense as to be indefensible, and yet it was driven by messianic imperialism. Philip was absolutely convinced that he was doing God's work and that miracles would be performed on his behalf. He was always ready to defer to churchly authority, and he acceded to the tyrannical Inquisition after 1559, thus quarantining Spain from northern Europe by stifling intellectual inquiry. Philip embarked on an ambitious and expensive foreign policy that was both strategic and ideological. Simple to define, it was impossible to execute. First was to establish and maintain Spain's position as hegemonic power in Europe. Second was to crush heresy wherever he met it, be it Protestant or Muslim. In his 55-year reign, the realm was at peace for only six months. The Spanish government used its super profits from control over silver production to pay for never-ending war against the emerging capitalist states of northern Europe. Philip sought to make Flanders tremble and terrify England while chastising the Turk and humbling the Moor. His reign illustrates the folly of war, a distraction from other important problems and a huge expense, rather than investing in infrastructure or some other long-term productive base. Spain identified greatness with constant wars of aggression. In 1598, at Philip II's death, Spain's economy remained undeveloped, even lacking its own armaments industry. The empire's debt was 15 times the annual income. Yet, to the Spaniards, military power was everything, the focus of attention. Artists reveal that even Philip II's dog wore a suit of armor. Spanish naval prowess was considerable. Spain maintained a position of great power for a long time fighting against the Ottoman, Dutch, English, and French, frequently all at once. This was as much a logistical feat as a tactical or strategic one. The most spectacular event was at Lepanto in 1571, a battle fought off the shores of Greece. <laughs> Lepanto was the last great sea battle of oared ships, galleys. It was essentially a conflict between the Habsburgs plus their allies, Venetians and the papacy, styled the Holy League, versus the Ottoman Turks, 
It was Christian versus Muslim. The Ottomans, of nomadic origin, sought territory, not dominion of the sea. But they assembled a great fleet, manned in large part by sea-minded, conquered peoples like Greeks. Each side floated more than 200 ships, but the Christians had more ships and more men. The fighting was fierce and bloody, hand to hand. Turkish Admiral Ali Pasha, captured, was dragged to the flagship of the Christian commander Don Juan, where he was beheaded. More than half of the Ottoman fleet was destroyed, along with its skilled sailors, archers, pilots, and petty officers. Ships could be rapidly rebuilt, but the men were irreplaceable. Lepanto viewed as a great divinely ordained victory against a foe that had seemed invincible became more important for its psychological impact. But the Ottoman state continued to expand and remained a threat. It fought Christian Europe for 500 years and held a vast and expanding empire during and after the first burst of European expansion. The war galley, appropriate for the short distances of the Mediterranean, was ill-equipped for the challenges of the Atlantic. And for that North Atlantic world, the Mediterranean no longer functioned as a vital center. After the Armada disaster in 1588 so celebrated by the English, Spain, undaunted, built the largest battle fleet in Europe and Spanish infantry continued to be acclaimed as the finest in Europe. But this was done at enormous expense. The Spanish Empire overseas was so large that it seemed impossible to determine what the truly vital interests really were. Spain squandered its wealth and manpower, expanding and defending its non-Spanish lands in Europe instead of recognizing that its real interests lay in America. By 1650, thanks to commanding global blue waters, Europe had already achieved maritime mastery in three separate overseas areas, America, Africa, and Asia, more specifically Central and South America eastern parts of North America, some parts of coastal sub-Saharan Africa, and small coastal enclaves in South Asia, and some parts of the Indonesian and Philippine archipelagos. Yet, neither the Portuguese nor the Spaniards were able to establish control over nearby North Africa, despite repeated attempts and the commitment of large resources of men and arms. And several centuries would be required for this global oceanic system to mature into European Atlantic global hegemony. The great Eurasian land empires, culturally vibrant, politically stable, and richer than the European oceanic newcomers, remained largely untouched and indifferent to these outsiders. Europe suffered a severe economic imbalance, especially with Asia, the center of world wealth. Europe had nothing Asia wanted except American silver. Yet Europeans craved all manner of Asian luxury goods. But the oceanic revolution marks a new competitive dynamic. Here is the beginning of an Atlantic-centered global trade and information network within which Europeans themselves become chief competitors, with changes in the range and carrying capacity of that network deeply affecting the rise and fall of successive oceanic metropolitan centers like Lisbon and Seville with others to follow.
Several European historians have suggested that the principal export of pre-industrial Europe was violence, expropriating land and labor, using warships to protect and prohibit trade flows. Certainly, Europeans were belligerently possessive, culturally intolerant, and supremely overconfident. This is exhibited in ferocious, one-sided slaughter, especially of Muslims. Figalgos and privateersmen at sea were like Eurasian warrior nomads, as aggressive and destructive as Scythians, Huns, or Mongols. The Asian nomads had commanded from horseback. The European mariners commanded from the quarterdeck. This image depicts both the reality of European power and its limits until the late 18th century. Perhaps we can also say that Oceanic Europeans succeeded the Eurasian steppe nomads as the great danger to Eurasian order, threatening and ultimately overturning the prevailing military, political, and economic balances. The result of this first burst of oceanic revolution was that a European-created sea frontier replaces the nomad-created steppe frontier as a critical meeting point between civilizations. But unlike the nomads even at their acme, the maritime Europeans function as a global force, not simply a Eurasian one. How did Europeans do this? Find out next time in Episode 7, A Changing Oceanic Europe. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg. Production by 1623 Studios in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Post-production and distribution by Albert Buichadé-Faré. Goodbye until next time.